Hello, I'm Patty Totocitle, the CEO of Casa de Esperanza, and I want to welcome you to Casa de Esperanza's Adelante, a virtual celebration of Latina-led advocacy. This project was supported by grant number 2016-TAAX-K039, awarded by the Office on Violence Against Women, U.S. Department of Justice. The opinions and other content expressed in this event are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the U.S. Department of Justice. We also thank the Allstate Foundation for their generous support. As some of you may know, a small group of Latina activists actually created Casa de Esperanza as a shelter in 1982. They created the organization so that there would be more education in our communities and also a safe place for Latinas to be able to come to if they were experiencing domestic violence. And we also then became bigger. We were a shelter, we created more programming in Minnesota, and then we launched the National Latino Network for Healthy Families and Communities in 2009. That's known as the NLN, the National Latino Network. And in 2011, we became a federally funded, designated, culturally specific resource center focused on working with organizations and communities that are providing services to Latinos and Latino communities and organizations across the country. We hope that you will join us over the next two weeks as we discuss culturally responsive advocacy, wellness, research, and leadership through the videos, the webinars, the TED Talk style plenaries that we'll have. Some of these sessions will be live, so you don't want to miss them. Although we're going through a period of social distancing, we can still connect virtually and, uh, and have fun with that. Let me take a minute to walk through the two-week multimedia event. During week one, we'll be posting new videos every day that anyone can take time and listen to, watch at their convenience. For week two, we'll be hosting daily webinars, afternoon talks and performances and opportunities to connect with one another. Networking is great to do even through virtual means. To start off our virtual celebration, I spoke with two outstanding Latina leaders, both of whom have experienced breaking glass ceilings. Representative Ileana ross Lakeman was the first Latina ever elected to Congress. She represented Florida's 47th district for 30 years from 1989 to 2019. And Senator Catherine Cortez Masto was the first woman elected to represent Nevada in the U.S. Senate and the first Latina ever elected to the U.S. Senate. Both Senator Cortez Masto and Representative Ross Lakin offer important perspectives on Latina leadership. They will share some of their stories, what they've learned about supporting rising Latina leaders and how it all connects back to the work mobilizing our comunidad and gender-based violence. Senator Castro Masto, it's so good to meet you. I've known Ileana for many years. We don't see each other every so often. She's done some things for us at Casa de Esperanza. Oh, and I am so oh. thrilled to be here with Catherine and, and you, Patty. It really, it is a, it is a real honor. Thank you. Well, thank uh, you. And me as well, Patty. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, I am so excited to participate you with kidding? you. This is fabulous. And continue to support. Yeah, I, I think it's wonderful what you're doing. Thank yeah. you so much. And we are just so excited that you will be the first session. You will help me open up our wonderful event. Uh, and uh, so this is very exciting. And I feel so privileged to have the and, opportunity. And Catherine, I was telling Patty that this is the first interview we've done together. The first Latina in the House and the first Latina in the Senate. Wow. I know. I know. And, and people an don't know that. They don't know that we met playing safe softball together. I know, no, I know, but you are a much better athlete than no. I was. So, Patty, no, we have a, uh, a bipartisan congressional uh, oh. softball team. Debbie Wasserman Schultz is uh, is the leader of the gang, and oh Jill and uh and 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 Catherine is uh, a good athlete. I'm. I'm a has been, but uh, <laughs> no, no, you were so important for the team, and we miss you. And we actually, so, obviously, nothing's going on right now. So nothing's going on everything. now. Yeah. Wow, that's a, yeah. And it was really, I mean, it's very few bipartisan events that happen, yeah. and the the softball team was one of them. 
Well, I told her that she is missed. She is missed. She is missed. Well, I loved every minute of it. I have some questions. Some will be the same for both of you. And then I have specific questions for each of you. So I'm going to start by with a question that's for both of you. Um, can you each kind of share a little bit of information about what it was like to be a leader in your own communities? And then what led you to go and pursue public office? And maybe we could start first with you, Ileana. Oh, gosh, I shouldn't get in front of the senator. But anyway, no, please. Um, I did not even know that I was the first Hispanic woman elected to the house until I got elected. And uh, of course, because it was a Florida election, the, the computers broke down and we didn't get the results until like 3.30 in the morning. And the Today Show called and they said, would you like to be on? And I said, well, it's, it's, always, it's already um, morning almost. So sure, I'll go on. And, and Katie Kirk says, how does it feel to be the first Hispanic woman in the house? I thought about it for a second. I said, well, you know, I don't want to correct you because I but I, I don't think that I'm the first Hispanic. I'm sure that there've been many others. And she goes, oh no, we did our research, you are. So that's how I found out that I was the first Hispanic, but it, it uh, Latina in the, uh, in the house, but it was a real thrill. I always said, I'm not the only one, I'm just the first. And now we've got so many uh, Latina members and I'm so proud of, uh, of everybody who's there. And I served in the house for 30 years, uh, 29 and change. And I loved every minute of it, as uh, Catherine does as well. Disappointed that Catherine didn't accept uh, uh, the opportunity to be our VP. She would have made history there again. But anyway, I loved every minute, and uh, and it was a great thrill. So, Catherine, you take it away. Okay, Catherine. Well, thank you. Listen, I am following on the heels of Ileana. She's got just an incredible reputation here in Congress, and uh, I was so pleased to be able to get to know her and work with her. Uh, and we'll continue to work with her because I know she's not done. Uh, but let me let me say this, because I think it is uh, important, and I think Ileana touched on it, particularly for women. We just do it, right? We, we know there's something that needs to be done. We're going to focus on it, and we're going to make it happen. We're going to solve problems. We're going to work to get there. And then we realize, oh, wow, nobody's been here before. This is the first time. So even for me in the United States Senate, as the first Latina, it's a similar uh, kind of experience where you don't think about it. You just think about, here's, I know why I'm going and this is why we, we need to be there. Most importantly for me, it wasn't about making history. It was really making sure now that we had uh, another voice at the table that's gonna represent a community who's traditionally uh, underrepresented. And we still see that uh, across the country now. I think it is so important that uh, as we work in government, the people who are elected, who are working in government, are just as diverse as the people we represent because that informs our policy, right? We, it informs good policy though, so that we are representing uh, everyone and that good policy is bringing everyone along and uh, we don't leave anyone behind. And, and I think that is so important and that's why I continue this, this kind of, I don't wanna say a fight, but I, I continue this advocacy that we need more representation. We are so underrepresented and uh, our voices are, are important and uh, we need to make sure that, that we're, we're using our voices and we're at the table and we're involved in those decisions. I was fortunate because I had a, uh, a family, a father who ran for local politics and I think he was ah. actually the first Latino. He was the first Latino in the Clown County Commission in Southern Nevada. And I watched uh, as he, how he and my mother just how good government was so important for our community. And uh, I think that's why my sister and I both got involved in what we do. I'm in, uh, in the Tell political world, sister. but in government, she is actually, she's a counselor. She works with kids. Her whole career has good always been working with underrepresented or kids that are in need. And right now she's a counselor at middle school and she loves it. Wow. Um, and so we're always involved, right? In, in, in good government and giving back in our community. And I, I think it's so important. You know, young girls can serve in so many capacities. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to be a teacher, uh, mm -hmm. so I know that uh, teachers play a pivotal role in, in our society. And you don't have to Absolutely. run for office, but I'm so glad that you had your dad do, to, to show you the way. I came from a, a non-political family in the sense that elective office was not, not, any, not no one in our office, in our, in our family did that. But uh, having been born in Cuba, coming over to the United States, uh, 
very happy to be a naturalized American, uh, we wanted to, to give back and we wanted to see uh, a Cuba be free and have human rights respected. So in that respect, we were involved, but not not involved in, in running for office. Mm-hmm. So I was the most surprised of all that I got, <laughs> that I got a lot of but I was not involved in politics in, in high school or in college, but I congratulate anyone who is involved. So I did not have that background, but, uh, but I'm glad I got to where I went, where I got to be. But, but Liliana, it's, and it's, you just said it's the passion, right? You mm-hmm. feel a passion to do something and that's what drives you, whatever profession Absolutely. that is. And I always tell folks, particularly the younger generation, just follow your passion. That will take you Whatever path you're is, that's going to take you be where your life uh, path is. That moves mountains. Right? That's right. Patty, that's we'll, we'll right. give you an opportunity to ask something. <laughs> <laughs> well, if not, well, you, and I will just carry the weight. You've <laughs> got a great segue into the next question and statement. So we, of course, want to promote Latina leadership across all sectors. But what challenges do you see that impact our pathways to leadership? What are those things that might get in the way or just have challenged you maybe on your pathways to leadership? Well, we're used to helping other people, but we're not so used to helping ourselves. And I think so much of what uh, uh, holds us back from running for office is that we think that that's for someone else, or we don't know how to fundraise. We don't know how to organize. We organize for others, but we don't think, we don't think that we, we know enough yet. And I need to be well-versed in this world affairs. And I need to know every intricate detail <laughs> of a budget. So we hold ourselves back. And, and we, we should not do that. We should, we should let ourselves fly. Often we're our own stumbling blocks. That's wonderful. And that's right. And, and, and let me just say, Ileana knows this because she's worked on this. And part of it is equal pay, right? There's already barriers, even when you're starting out as a, a Latina, that right now, if you're trying to even just, you take a job in, in the private sector or even in the public sector, but in the private sector, you see this more often, um, you're getting paid, what, 54 cents to the dollar uh, yep. to, to, to uh, someone else. And so that right there is a barrier just on entry and coming in to then step in to be a leader. So the work that we have done here is to try to promote, take down those barriers and and pass legislation that at least brings that type of equality, whether it's for that for uh, equal pay or child care or mm-hmm. uh, areas where we know that even in, in, in domestic violence situations, areas where we know that there are barriers, maybe because there's language barriers or there's other things that are just uh, preventing uh, Latinas from even just stepping up to start that pathway. And we want to make it much easier for them. Um, yeah, and if there's that a passion. silver lining in this COVID mm-hmm. tragedy, mm-hmm. and that's really overstating it, but if there's one thing, it's 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 raised our consciousness of yeah. who essential workers are mm-hmm. and how essential it is to have uh, schools open and to have a daycares, a daycare open, because what do you do as a as as a worker who is essential? Meaning you're working in a in a uh, in the cafeterias of different businesses or, or or working as a janitor. How can what what do you do with your child at home? So I think that at the very least, it's bringing to the forefront how essential it is to have uh, uh, daycare, childcare opportunities for working parents because without that society cannot function. So at the very least, uh, there's a greater consciousness of that. Great. And you both have mentioned some ways to overcome some of the barriers that you mentioned. Are there other effective ways that as Latinas, we can overcome some of the barriers that you mentioned? Wow, you know, I, I will tell you what I've done here when I first got here, because when I walked through the halls uh, here on, on in the Senate, very few um, people of color. Uh, and um, I started questioning, not, not just at my level, but the staff level and even, you know, entry level, getting, getting more, opportunities to work here uh, in the Senate. So I actually just started conversations. I pulled uh, different kind of coffee clutches together with, with various groups from, from Latinas to um, uh, African-American, Asian-American, Pacific Islander, Native American, LGBTQ, and, and really said, what, 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 what were your barriers? What's preventing you from even getting here and then moving up? And you think about this, uh, part of it was just getting here. Uh, because to even work as an intern uh, on the Senate side, uh, most of that is you either have to come from a, a family of means that can pay for you to be here, or you have to have some sort of 
uh, school scholarship or some sort of foundation supporting you. If you don't have any of that, you're not going to get an opportunity to even come through here, be an intern, and then work your way up and try to get a, other opportunities in the Senate. So that was the first barrier that I thought, wow, well, the very people that I want to bring here, the people of color who are not going to have the means to afford to come here or opportunity to get that scholarship, let's create that scholarship. Let's go out and seek them and let's pay them to come here as an intern. That to me was the first barrier to, to really bringing more people of color here and then giving them the opportunity uh, to be here and then promote and show what they've got and then and then really apply for other jobs and other opportunities here in the Senate. Well, you're so right, because it sounds very nice. You say, come to D.C. and be an intern. Well, the housing costs are prohibitive in, in Washington, D.C. You hear a lot about New York City and, and, and big cities like that. But Washington, D.C. is out of the budget of any any young person, uh, especially those who come from an underprivileged ba economic background. So it, it sounds very nice, the opportunities that we have, but it's really for the for the wealthy or those who can pull together enough enough friends and, and don't mind sharing a, a, an apartment with four other people or five <laughs> other people. So uh, we have to have uh, expectations and give them the means of uh, how to fulfill that dream. Otherwise, it's a it's a nice sounding platitude, but with no reality behind it. Well, and what I pick up from that is that regardless of the sector or the opportunity, we have to think deep about what it would take for someone to not only come into it, but stay in that opportunity. So I really appreciate both your comments about that. This question is for you, Senator. Protecting survivors and stopping human and child trafficking is a priority for you. I mean, we have picked that up um, from you. So why do you think it is important to support increased leadership of Latinas and Latinx community members when it comes to addressing and preventing human trafficking? Yeah, that's a great question. So here's the what I know based on my experience, both in dealing with human trafficking and domestic violence in general and, and prevention in both of those areas. As I look at the data and the information, uh, quite often we see communities of color, women of color who are trapped Mm -hmm. um, trapped in a, some sort of, if you're in a domestic violence situation, you are trapped in a, a family situation that you can't get out of. And you do not have the means to literally leave a husband if, if he is the sole breadwinner, or uh, there's a language barrier that you don't know how to seek that assistance. And so there are challenges there. And, and, and what I see both in our communities of color around women is we've got to give them the resources, one, to know that they're available, they exist in our communities and their communities where they live, make sure we can communicate with them, and then at the end of the day, let them know how they can uh, become survivors. And, and to me, that is the work that I have done, not just here in the Senate, but when I was an attorney general and, and even before that, when I was a prosecutor. And so the goal here is to make sure that there are so many women that know there's resources of available. And part of what government does is, is support those resources, working with the private sector, working with uh, NGOs to make sure we're reaching out and, and finding and helping those women. That's still in this day and age, it's happening. And, and even now, in the middle of a pandemic, when everybody's sheltering in place, the stressors on the family are, have increased and magnified. And I'm even more concerned about uh, particularly women who are, are now trapped and in, in kind of in that cycle. Well, I congratulate you for the work that you've been doing, Senator. It's really remarkable. And you're so right. COVID has uh, has really made the situation worse because uh, people feel trapped in their homes and 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 wives and, and partners of abusive uh, uh, individuals don't see another avenue for them. So it's really um, made this issue all the more pressing. So I congratulate you for your long years of service uh, to try to bring some relief uh, to so many battered women and, and, uh, and human trafficking victims, et cetera. And we've changed our outlook as a society uh, on how we look at these individuals. They're not, um, they're not the criminals, but they're the victims. Right. And that's changed a lot of the way that the police and law enforcement officials and prosecutors have, have looked at this problem. And that's right. In Italy, I was a prosecutor here in D.C. in the U.S. Attorney's Office, oh. and I prosecuted some of the, the prostitution cases here. 
And as I then learned about human trafficking and really what's involved and that there truly are victims and survivors, I would think back and think, oh my gosh, the woman that, you know, I was a prosecutor and I worked with and she came in for, for prostitution and, and uh, I had to move forward with a prosecution against her and charge her. Was she really a victim of sex trafficking? And now, as I look back, I think, yes. Now what I know now, I wish I'd known then. And that was my goal really is to bring that education to a lot of our prosecutors and our judges to make them understand what they're, and law enforcement, to make them understand what's coming before them, that these really are victims. They're not, they're, they're not uh, criminals here. They're victims uh, and they're taken advantage of and we need to help them and, and make sure that they're survivors. So it, it is yeah. true. And it, it's part of that education was key. And we've done that within the last, what, 10 years, and we've got to do more of it. It's been phenomenal, especially mm -hmm. when you represent Nevada. We've got Las Vegas, which is, a, 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 unfortunately, it's one of the hot spots for sexual and human trafficking and sex workers, and Miami as well. It's, it's the gateway right. to the Caribbean and, and Latin America. So uh, we both are from uh, areas where we have a lot of victims, and now we're looking at them as victims instead of criminals. So uh, I'm so glad uh, for this new outlook that we have. Wonderful. Congratulations, Catherine. Well, and Ileana, you are always known as the champion in Congress in efforts to prevent and improve the response to domestic violence. That's and right. you played a key role in securing the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, also known as VAWA. And I'm very keen on what happened in 2013, where there were important protections for survivors of marginalized communities, including the LGBTQ communities, the immigrant communities, and our native and indigenous communities. And I want to go back to what you said, Catherine, that we need, we don't want to leave anyone behind. And that was the intent of the 2013 uh, VAWA. So why do you think, Ileana, that it is important to support increased leadership of Latinas and Latinx community leaders when it comes to improving the efforts to end gender-based violence? Well, it really is because of wonderful organizations like the ones that you represent, that whole uh, beautiful backdrop behind you, Casa de la Esperanza, House of, of Hope, uh, you give uh, refuge and, and sanctuary to these uh, to these victims. The National Latina uh, Network and Adelante. I mean, there's so many wonderful uh, organizations outside of Congress that are raising our uh, awareness. Uh, they're educating communities. They're educating members of the House and the Senate. Uh, not everybody is a leader on this issue, like like the senator is. A lot of them need to to think of this crime in a new way. And, uh, and she is just, a, Catherine is just a perfect person to bring that experience as a prosecutor and saying, look, our society used to look at these people and these individuals as, as criminals. They're the victims. And, and you've got to train law enforcement, but it really comes down to organizations like yours. You changed hearts and minds. You made that BAWA uh, bill a reality. <laughs> And it looked like it was going nowhere. And what a shame. But you you really uh, used your muscle and, and the legislative power and you got it through. Amazing. Well, we got right. it. But, but let me let me like you. And Patty, let me just say, because, I, yes, I absolutely agree that that what the work that you have done has been phenomenal. But I don't think Illy, you know, people need to recognize what Ileana has done in her That's career right. and what she has fought for. It is not easy to come to Congress and get something done and really promote it and work it. And she is one of the pioneers in this space and knows it so well and has so much respect for all of the good work that she has done. And she's not taking credit for it. I'm gonna make sure she does because <laughs> no. she is missed. Next she is subject. missed and it, <laughs> it is about bipartisan support here and working together and solving problems. And she knows that. And that's why she well, was you, such a because success. Because you're one of those fair-minded folks who sees good in people and you think, okay, you may be a Republican, but you still have a good idea. You're a Democrat, but you still have, a good, you know, you don't see the party labels. You're looking at people who can solve problems. And those are the kind of folks that we want more of. We want to clone okay. you and have you have a Senate full of, of people like you. Who think that way. You don't see party labels. You see past party labels. Right. Well, and that's why we also wanted to bring the two of you together, because we know that you've both been champions in the work, all the work that you've done that supports 
survivors, victims of uh, gender-based violence. So that's, it's just wonderful to see your exchange together. So I have a final question for both of you. What words of wisdom would you like to share with survivors and with advocates that are out there who are really working toward reforms, want reforms, and who want to actually think about becoming more civic leaders in their community? What would you share as advice? And maybe we'll start with the senator. You bet. You, you know, um, Ileana touched on this. I, I would um, start with uh, that women have a tendency, particularly, um, to think that they have to check boxes before they can move in their career, right? I have to have the experience. I have to make sure I have the education. I have to do this. And, and quite often, men will say, oh, I don't know. How much does a job pay? Okay, I'll maybe be interested or not. You want me so to I think for... <laughs> yeah. And so for, for women, and, and I tell them, just believe in yourself. If you've got the passion and you uh, want to make a difference and you know this is where you need to be, then believe in yourself to get there. Have that confidence because you can do it. Women are, are famous multitaskers mm -hmm. and we have the ability to solve problems. That's what we do. That's why the women in the Senate, we all get together on a regular basis and we have dinner and we talk and we talk about legislation because we are problem solvers. We just want to get it done. And so that's why I always tell, uh, particularly women in, in general, just have true faith in yourself and confidence, follow your passion. And uh, people will see how insincere you are in whatever it is, whether it is in the private sector, the government, just do it, believe in it, and don't think that you don't have the ability or you need to uh, check some sort of box to get there. Yes, I so agree. And I would follow up with that with saying, and once you get to that position of power, help other women. Don't think, okay, now I've made it. Uh, you know, that's fine. Hey, look at me. It's all about me. No, that's what the guys do. Don't want to be um, uh, gender shaming that way. But sometimes that happens. Women, we have to be helping other women because we don't have as many networking opportunities as, uh, as the ma males have. And so... Uh, uh, we need to help other women once we get to where we want to go and and uh, and help them realize their goals. And I'm thinking about this this little pin. And that was my first pin when I got elected in 1989 wow. in the 101st Congress and how far women have come since that time. How many women senators we have of both parties and 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 the best is yet to come. I'm very optimistic about the promise of America and uh, I'm feeling that the best days are in front of us. And I want to congratulate the senator for everything that she's done. And she's just a picture perfect embodiment of the American dream realized. So it's, it's an honor to to have worked with her uh, for a little bit of time that I was there with her. And uh, I want to wish you much success. And then next time you get offered the vice presidentship, uh, you have to turn it down. Okay. I'll call you first. I'll make sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. And then you call me after that, okay? <laughs> All right. You got it, Patty. <laughs> Well, I just want to say it's it's been a privilege and I'm so honored to have had this time with both of you and to see you both together, to be able to see you exchange and share words with our audience and participants that will join us in these wonderful events. And you mentioned networking. There will be some time for networking even. We have to do that virtually if we can't do it in person. So I just uh, want to thank you again and let you know that we will be following you uh, Senator, and we will stay in touch with you. Please do. Uh, it's, uh, it's and, and promote this as a historic first, the first Latina in the House and the first Latina Senator. Wow, <laughs> nobody's yeah. done this before. Gracias, Patty. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I want to say a big thank you to Senator Catherine Cortez Masto and Representative Ileana Ross Layton. What a wonderful way to start off our Adelante celebration. To listen to both of their voices, their wisdom, their thoughts was just a wonderful privilege for me. We'll be spending the next two weeks further exploring how Latina leadership intersects with and informs the gender-based violence prevention movement. Together, we're creating healthy families and communities where everyone can thrive. Follow along with the hashtag AdelanteNLN or at our event site, AdelanteNLN.org. And thank you to everyone for tuning in.